a joke? <sighs> no, okay. You probably heard this one. This is, you know, it's not, if it offends you, you know, get over it. This is five ways, five ways for a man to be completely happy. And all the men said, amen. Amen. Okay. You can take this to, to Mildred oh. if you'd like. All right. Number one, be with the woman who makes you laugh. Do you agree? Five ways. Number two, be with the woman who gives you her time. Agreed? Number three, be with the woman who takes care of you. Agreed? Number four, be with the woman who really loves you. Agreed? Number five, finally make sure these four women don't know each other. <laughs> okay, you laughed. Praise God. Amen. Mark, amen. All right. This is an exciting lesson, guys. It's, I call it uh, faith or fate, the eyes of faith versus fate. You know, the problem in, in, in the body of Christ is we, we're mental assenting to things that haven't reached our heart. When something reaches your heart, you begin to see different in your heart, on the inside. You begin, I'm seeing things that I never saw before. I'm seeing favor. I'm seeing it in my life. And it's because of God. You know, He gets the glory. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 4, what have you got that you haven't received? Every good thing in our life is a gift. We need to give Him the praise. Amen? But see, a lot of people live by fate. What is fate? Whatever will be, will be. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. You know, you never know what's going to happen. That is not how God's called us to live. God's called, but, but it, it has to do with how we're seeing on the inside. This is why it's imperative, and I mean imperative, that we continually hear and hear and hear and hear because you're always hearing something. Everywhere you go, you're hearing something. Well, when you hit this age, I'm around people all the time. Well, you're this age, you're that age. Oh, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. I mean, I'm telling you, those words create pictures. That's right. yeah. And you have to counter them. You've got to be, you've got to hear more from God through the word than you're hearing from the world around you. you. See, the problem in our culture is, is what people are seeing in our culture is trumping what they're hearing at church. Right. And that's why we have what we have. We're seeing the wrong things. But you and I can change that. That's good news. Amen? And this is where the I call it the eye of faith versus the eye of fate. What is fate? Go to your outline. Here it is. Dictionary definition. Fate. It's the development of events beyond a person's control regarded as determined by a supernatural power. The developments of... The development of events beyond a person's control regarded as determined by a supernatural power. In other words, God's pulling the puppet strings. Whatever will be, will be. It's not scriptural. Amen. It's not scriptural. This is what, you know, someone said to me recently, uh, uh, my wife and I, and they said, well, you know, they're praying for rain and, you know, God, we need this and why this happened and all that stuff. And I just can't stand that stuff. And I'm nice. I'm really nice. That's my wife. And, and I say, listen, if God's controlling everything, He's not doing a very good job. It's a bunch of nonsense. And the church is bought into it. Hook, line, sinker, fisherman boots, tackle box, and everything else. And that's why we're sinking. Why would He say, pray for His kingdom to come and His will to be done on earth as it is in heaven if it happens independent of my cooperation? Amen. Faith is taking what God has provided by grace and implementing it into this world. And it starts by what you're seeing on the inside. The reason people struggle with faith is that their heart is not convinced God's good. Listen, God putting some sickness on you or some cancer on you because He's trying to teach you something, that's not good. I don't want to hang out with someone like that. I don't trust someone like that. But yet we teach this nonsense in church. Right. Right. Recently I heard someone say, no one gets a pass. And I thought, I do. His name's Jesus, my Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Yeah. Now this doesn't mean I don't have issues in this world. Jesus said, in the world you're going to have stuff. Tribulation. The word tribulation, the ellipsis in Greek, it's when you feel like there's no way out. How many of you know we have those times in this world? But they're not from God. I run to God because I know He's good. If I don't think He's good, I'm going to run away from Him. That's why people run to the things of the world, including Christians, because they're not fully convinced God's good. 
How many people are, well, I was just shaking my fist at God and saying, why God? Why are you shaking your fist at God? Because somebody told you that God put that on you to teach you something. Come on. Man, I'm glad God's good. Yeah. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And then I become that blessed man or woman who trusts in Him. But I can't trust in somebody who I'm not sure is good. How do I see God? Do I see Him as good? You know what Jesus said? He said in John 14, 9, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay, what did Jesus do? He went around healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He went around doing good, healing all. Amen? Amen. Acts 10, 38. He did, that's what Jesus did. You never see him like, okay, I'm going to cause this car wreck or this donkey wreck. <laughs> I'm going to put this on you to teach you something. Can you learn from that? You can learn from putting your hand on a hot stove not to do it, but there's a better way. Amen. So fate, fate, is my heart seeing faith or faith? Listen to me. This is why, and I'm going to say it again. Well, let me share some other stuff with you. The, the enemy of your faith is passivity. Look at, the, look, look at how many people lay out a church. Well, maybe they're getting it somewhere else. No, they're not. If you're laying out a church, you're laying out of your relationship with God. Guaranteed. Is that too hard? It's pretty honest. I'm not talking about going on vacation. That's great. Not just not every week. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I'm not saying this for me. I'm fine whether you come or not. You need the word and so do I. God's given me stuff and it's powerful and it's life changing. And if you'll take it and apply it to your life, it'll change your life. Guaranteed. I'm done being politically correct. I love God too much. He loves me and I love you with His love. Calm down. Okay. <laughs> God loves you, therefore He hates what's hurting you. And the number one thing that hurts you is passivity. You know when people get passive? When there's not, the heat's not on. Everything's good, so let's kick back. Look at the children of Israel in the Old Testament. What happened when everything started going, getting good? Idolatry. What's idolatry in the New Covenant? Covetousness. Ephesians 5, 5. Colossians 3, 5. It's easy to become all about me when things are good. Listen, the greatest joy you'll ever find is in the presence of the Lord. You can be happy on a crowded street or you can be happy in a cabin looking at a mountain scenery. It doesn't matter because He's with you. And that's not just information. It's a revelation to your heart. I can sit out there in my old beat up B van and worship the Lord and it's like I'm like whatever because I'm in Christ. Hallelujah. We keep looking out here. The Bible says the eyes of men are in the ends of the earth. Wisdom is right before him that has understanding. But the eyes of a fool, they're always looking out there for what's available to them right here. Thank you, Jesus, for that thunder silence. All right. Passivity will destroy your life. Now listen, I'm going to get to the outline. It's right here. But I need to say this. Because in order to change the vision of your heart, you're going to have to change what you're looking at. And not just once in a while. It needs to be a 24-7 operation. You know, God wants to go to the reunion with you. You know, He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You know, He's interested in talking to you no matter where you're at. Church isn't the only answer. It's just a springboard. Thank you, Jesus. Look at it. Matthew 13. 24 and 25. Listen to this, guys. Look at me. If you don't know you're in a battle, you're losing. One more time. If you don't know you're in a battle, you're losing. Christians all the time are falling. All the time. And why didn't God? I thought I believed this. Listen, any seed that doesn't reach the womb of your heart doesn't reproduce. If it just stays in your brain and doesn't get in the womb, it's just information. Hello. I can't help it. I'm excited. Jesus speaking. Another parable. Put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed into, in his field. Jesus was that good man. He sowed good seed in his field. But watch what happened. But while he slept, excuse me, but while men slept, that's you and me. Leave this up there. His enemy came. That's the devil if you read the whole parable. 
sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. That word slept there. Are you ready for this? It means apathetic. It means indifferent to one's salvation. How does the church sleep? When we're indifferent or passive to what we've already have in Christ, we're sleeping. And wrong understanding can come in. Like, well, it's God's will. Then you just got to go, oh, man, I'm telling you, don't resist that. Don't pray against that. I'm believing my children are blessed. Yes. Amen. 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 What it doesn't, well, well it'll, if it's God's will, Chris, it'll happen. No, it happens when I agree with God and release God's will into the life of my family. Yes. If you don't know you're in a war, you're losing. Yeah. Most Christians don't. Why do you think, call, think he called it the weapons of our warfare? Hello. Why didn't he say the kitchen aid of our baking utensils? <laughs> <laughs> because this is not a bakery. This is a war. And if you don't understand you're in that war, you are losing. Thank you, Jesus. This is, what, this is why we have to understand the grace message is given to empower you, not to make you passive and lazy. It's given to empower you. It's given to fire you up. It's given you fill you full of the fire of God. If you're not fired up, you're not under grace. You're under mercy. <laughs> Grace is available, but you're not under it. This is why so many, oh, help me, Lord. So many Christians are managing their sin instead of overcoming it. Hello. Woo. God hasn't called me to manage it. He's called me to overcome it. Thank you. Thank you. Romans 6.14. Amen. Woo. Glory to God. Where am I at? I want to, faith, let me just say one more thing before we get to the outline. After faith. You know, look at this world. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, the whole world lies in wickedness. Now think about that. Have you ever just meditated on weeds that grow in your garden? You know, if you don't do nothing, if you're passive about your garden, I guarantee you corn and carrots are not coming up. You know what's coming up? Weeds. Weeds. If we're passive about the things of God, you know what's not coming up? Wheat. You know what it is coming up? Tares or weeds. We get it, we're called to tend our garden. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 in the Amplified Bible says, you're the garden of God. We're not earning. We're just tending and keeping the garbage out. Now, well, bless God, I'm under grace. <laughs> no, you're under idiocy. You're under deception. That's... Uh, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Help me, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thinking about telling my joke again just to calm me down. <laughs> All right. Look at the outline. Once more, fate is the development of events beyond a person's control regarded as determined by a supernatural power. Let's talk about the importance of sight. The importance of sight. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. There's other verses up there you can look up, but look at Zechariah 4, verse 1 and 2. Now, we like Zechariah... Chapter 4, verse 6, where it says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And then the next verse says, We speak grace, grace to the mountain. But watch this. Go to Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1. And the angel that talked with me came again and walked, or excuse me, waked me, and as, as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, <laughs> Awake to righteousness and sin not. 1 Corinthians 15, 34. And he said unto me, What do you see? You know, God's saying the same thing to you and I today. What do you see? Not with your physical eyes, but what do you see in your heart? We need to change the picture of our heart. It starts by believing that God is good to me. It starts by believing that God's got my best interest at heart. It starts by believing that God is my friend and not my enemy. It starts by believing that God and I are on the same team. It starts by believing that God is my Father because I'm born again. And Jesus, I'm in Christ and He's in me. It starts by believing that I'm the temple of the Holy Ghost. It starts by believing that God will never leave me nor forsake me. That's where it starts. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. This is exciting. What are you seeing? Look at this next line. We will not walk a path we cannot see. You won't walk in the goodness of God if you're not seeing Him as good. You know why prosperity, financial prosperity is a struggle to most of us? 
Notice I said us, including me. It's because I don't see that all the time. I've seen the abuses. I'm looking more at the abuses and using that as an excuse rather than looking at the truth. But I'm changing. Come on. I'm changing because God's changing my heart and I'm understanding it the right way and not the wrong way. Amen? It's not about money. It's about having money to give. It's about furthering the kingdom of God. It's not about how much you have in your savings. It's about how much you get in the kingdom. That's prosperity. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> we will not walk a path we cannot see. For example, the reason many people struggle with the goodness of God is they do not see Him as good. I have watched this time and time again where people that believe that God puts bad stuff on you, that God is controlling it and you never know what God's going to do. Time and time again, they're almost never, almost never fired up for God. Almost never. Isn't that amazing? My lightning quick brain says, hmm, there must be a connection. <laughs> All right. We need to look at the common denominator of these verses. I'm not going to do all of them, but I'm going to do a couple of them. Look at Psalm 119, verse 105. Psalm 119, verse 105. And then 2 Corinthians 3.18. A lot of verses we could do. Look at this. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now look at 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled or open face... Beholding us in a glass, that's 2 Corinthians 3.18, or a mirror, watch this, or a mirror, watch this, we're beholding as in a glass, it's present tense verb, continuously looking as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord were changed, metamorphosed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now there's other verses up here, and I got down here. What is the common denominator of all these verses? Sight. 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 What are you, not physical sight, but heart sight. Not physical sight, but heart sight. Back up in 2 Corinthians 3 to verse 13. Watch this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13. And not as Moses, which put a veil or a covering over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished or done away with. Next verse. But their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded. Their minds were blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil, it's untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil's done away in Christ. In other words, leave that up there. When they hear the Old Testament, they're not seeing the life of Christ that keeps them. They're just seeing a bunch of rules and laws that they have to keep. That's why they're not attracted to God. Come on. If you think Christianity is about you keeping the rules, you don't know Jesus. Jesus kept the rules perfectly. Perfect. Hallelujah. Am I saying right behavior doesn't matter? Not as far as your right standing with God, but it'll produce right behavior if you get a revelation. It's a fruit, not a root. Now watch this. So their minds are blinded when you read the Old Testament. Look at the next verse. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. The veil that was torn from top to bottom, that separated... God, man from God has been torn, but it's on their heart. They can't see Jesus. I see this all the time. Well, it's Passover season. It's Pentecost season. It's tabernacles. And you know, you've got to bring your most holy offering to the Lord. No, Jesus is our holy offering. And if you think there's one season more special than another time of the year, listen, we can, we can honor that as far as what it signifies in that sense, but if you're going to make it about you keeping that and that this time of the year is holier than that time of the year, you don't know the new covenant. The veil's still on your heart. Hello. Now look at the next verse. This is what I'm after. Verse 16. Nevertheless, when it, your heart, turns to the Lord Jesus, when your heart shifts, when it clicks into gear, when it turns to Jesus, the veil's taken away. And that taken away is a present tense Greek verb. It means it starts to be taken away. The more I my, my keep my focus on Him, the more the veil's removed from my heart and I can see the new covenant and I can see the goodness of God. You want a nugget? You want a good one? You sure? Can you handle it? I'll just throw it at you. We'll break it down sometime. You know I love the book of Revelation. 
and I know it's about the revelation of Jesus Christ, even though I had one guy tell me, no, it's not the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's what God showed Jesus, the things that must shortly come to pass. In other words, it's about judgment. Well, there's judgment in it, but for the believer, the judgments were put on Jesus. If you don't believe the revelation of Jesus Christ is the revelation of Jesus Christ, I ain't got nothing to say to you. Argue with the wall. <laughs> but the woman in Revelation chapter 12, you know, there's a woman there. And the dragon, the devil, sits before the woman ready to devour her child as soon as, it was born, as soon as it's born. And for years I would read people say, well, the woman, we know Mary gave birth to, to Jesus and she was a virgin. And, and sure, there's an application there. And okay. And then, then some people say, no, no, that uh, the woman is, is the nation of Israel. And then others say, no, no, the woman is the church. And no, no. The, and all these different things people say, I'll tell you who the woman is. The Lord show me that. It's the free woman that Paul talks about in Galatians chapter 4. And it says, cast out the son of the bond, cast out the bondwoman and her son. And it uses Sarah and Hagar. And it says, cast out the bondwoman. The woman spoke. See, Satan always fights the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what he fights. The woman spoken of in Revelation chapter 12, I totally believe, is the free woman that he's talking about. It's talking about new covenant. That's why Satan stands there ready to devour that child as soon as it's born. He does not want you to see Jesus. So you guys are going. <laughs> That's hot off the press, actually. But I've been meditating on it for a little while. It's really good. I'll tell you, the scriptures are so powerful. You really see the, the word of God when you have a relationship with God. Hallelujah. Doubt, look at this one. Doubt is a result of lack of vision. I'm going to give it to you. Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. Right? Or they cast off restraint. Doubt is a lack of vision. You can't see in your heart. You're not seeing in your heart. For example, healing. You're not seeing yourself as healed in your heart. It's a lack of vision. So guess what's not happening? See, you only receive what you can see. Seeing is believing. Can anybody hear that? I'm talking about seeing with your heart. Then, you, then it doesn't matter what you're seeing with your natural eyes, you're seeing with your heart. You know what I love about the encourager, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit? Notice he's the helper, not the doer. I'll say that again. He's the helper, not the doer. Amen. I thought he was the doer. I know. <laughs> That's why I said that. He's the helper. He's the helper. He keeps your vision alive. He keeps your vision alive. I'm telling you, if you don't have an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit and the baptism in the Holy Spirit and praying in the Holy Ghost, I'm telling you, I guarantee you're going to be run down. This world pulls you down so hard you don't even, sometimes you can't even, but I'm telling you, God keeps you up. I am so thankful. He lit the fire, but it's up to me to put wood on it and keep it burning. How do you do that? You pray in the Holy Ghost. That's so simple. Nah, I don't know about that. See, our intellectual, fat heads, gray matter, whatever you want to call it, that's the problem. That's the problem. He keeps your hope up even when it doesn't look like there's, there's nothing to hope for. There's that, nothing good to look at. It doesn't look good out here. He keeps your vision alive. He, he guides you into the truth. He opens the word up. Sometimes I get so excited about revelation. I'll tell him, man, honey, I know everything. Just ask me something. That's how God makes you feel. I know better than that in myself. But the Lord opens stuff up and it is so amazingly awesome. God wants you and I to walk through this life in the afterglow of fellowship and relationship with Him. People all the time, they're, they're looking for this and looking for that and looking for here and you know. Dust in the wind. All we do is dust in the wind. Same old song. <laughs> Amen? That's Ecclesiastes right there. You know that? I'm telling you, everything you and I look for is in Him. Not in religion. See, religion, man's religion, is the counterfeit picture of relationship with God. Amen. I'm not trying to be mean when I say this, but where I grew up, I remember thinking as a kid, Man, all them, Jesus had a plate behind his head. That's what I thought. It looked like a plate. I guess it was a halo. And it just didn't seem exciting. Every picture I've seen of Jesus was this. It just didn't look like fun. 
And then if I got serious about God, where I grew up, I wasn't allowed to get married. And I wanted to get married. You know why? I like sex! <laughs> Is that too honest? You should have been in the marriage seminar we had this week. I like honesty. I can't stand religion because it's fake. It's fake as fake can be. See, somebody, oh, you don't say that in church. We need to say that in church. And it's great. <laughs> Doubt is a result of a lack of vision. Once we see something, it cannot be stolen. When you see something on the inside, no one can take it from you on the outside. That's right. That's right. God's, look at Genesis 15.1. What are we looking at? Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1. I didn't see who's all, who all left after that. <laughs> After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. The word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision. See, if you're just seeing words and it's not creating a vision, you're missing it. The God, the Holy, let the whole, that's what meditation is all about. When you spend time with Him, He begins to give you vision. You start seeing stuff. You start seeing how He's applying it to your life. God's got big things for you and I. But if we don't see it on the inside, we won't see it on the outside. But you've got to spend time with him to let you that vision inc incubate and, 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 and come to fruition. And you'll start seeing, oh my word, God loves me. God loves me. God's got a plan for my life. I'm not here just to exist a number of years and then die and go home and make no difference. Right. I'm here to make a difference. Come on, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. The word of the Lord came in him in a vision. The word come in this verse, uh, well, no, actually... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, hey, it means to come, to pass, it means to exist, it means to become, it means to happen, it means to occur. Look at Genesis 13. This is powerful. This is where Abram and Lot, remember Lot, Abram's nephew? Look at this one. Genesis chapter 13, verses 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, now this is where God sets the land before him. You remember the story? And, and, and Abram says to his nephew Lot, whatever you choose, I'll choose the other one. And Lot, whose name means veiled, by the way. Isn't that interesting? Lot's a picture of a carnal Christian. You can read that over in 2 Peter chapter 2 in the New Testament. But Lot, man, I'm going to pick the good stuff. This is what looks good. How many time do we, how many times do we do the same thing? Whatever looks good to the physical eyes without getting counsel from the Lord. And, and Lot, after, but watch this. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot had left, he chose the good land. And, and after he leaves, he's separated from him. He's, he, the Lord tells Abram, lift up now thy eyes and look from the place where you are. God wants you to look from the place where you are physically. Stop going somewhere to try to get a better vantage point and have a relationship with him and you'll be able to see from right where you are in life. All right. All right. So I think sometimes to have a church, I mean, my word, you don't plant churches in cornfields. You go where there's more people. But you go where God puts you. That's right. Amen? And you Amen. bloom where you're planted. And you begin to see from where you are. And you'll see. Look at that. Look from where you are. Look northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Next verse. For all the land which you see, for all the land which you see, to thee will I give it and to thy seed forever. God gives you what you see Thank you. through the eye of faith. You know, there's only one big shot in the kingdom of God, and his name is Jesus. And if you're born again, he's in you. Amen? And God wants you to see in accordance with who's in you. All the land which you see, I will give it you. Notice he didn't say that, and even the land that you don't see, it's only what you see. This is why, hear me and hear me clear, one of the most important things in your life and my life is our intimate time with God where we just pull away and we see. And then we go out and because we're seeing something like Jesus said in John 5, 19, I don't do anything except what I see my Father do. When did he see his Father do it? His intimate time with the Father. Next verse. We're flying. Hang on. And I will make your seed as the dust of the earth so that if a man can number the dust, what is he doing? Vision. Can we say vision? vision? Look at the dust. Look at the sand during the daytime. Look at the stars at night. And if you can number them, so shall your seed be numbered. What is he doing with Abram? Helping him to see. 
This is why I say this. You cannot live on somebody else's revelation. You know that? You can't. you got to get the word from... This is why people get frustrated. Well, they didn't change my life. Well, I'm going to bring little Johnny to Sunday school. And that church better change his life. Listen, people do what they see. My children read the Bible because they see us do it. Amen? Amen. I'm not saying they're perfect and I'm not saying we don't have to get on them a little bit. But you know what? When they see, they're going to emulate what they see. Thank you, Jesus, for that one head nod or two or whatever it was. <laughs> All right. How one sees themselves is how that person will walk. Example, if you see yourself as a sinner saved by grace or as a son of God. This is the difference, I said this earlier, between managing sin or reigning over it. The culture, schools, etc. What they're seeing in society is trumping what they're hear hearing at church. Look at John 8, 38. Watch this. Get ready to say, wow. I've talked about this verse before, but it's amazing. John 8, 38. Jesus speaking. He says, I speak what I have seen with my father. This is where people don't, you know, well, just get your little confession book and speak the word and speak the word and speak the word. And that's got some merit to it. But listen to me. If you're just speaking the word and you're not seeing it in your heart, it's just a vain reputation. Repetition. Thank you. Amen? Amen. Can you hear that? Amen. But look at it. But it'll help if you, if you begin to put faith in it. You know when I see the most from the word of God? When I pay attention. Instead of saying, well, you can't understand this stuff, I say, oh, yeah. I saw stuff this week about when John baptized Jesus, and we've talked about that before, and the transference of the priesthood. I'm telling you what, I about jumped out of my skin. I was so excited. You get like that about the Word of God? Yes. It's what the world's looking for. They're trying to cover it with so many, you know, the cars, the house, the cash, all that kind of stuff. They're trying to cover it up, and I'm telling you, it's in Him. Jesus said, I speak what I have seen with my Father. And you do that which you have seen with your Father. People do what they're seeing on the inside. Amen. Praise God. That's an amazing verse. We'll be back to it. Number two, words create pictures. Unless a message creates a picture, it will not be retained. Unless what I'm saying to you creates a picture, you'll forget it. You may remember one or two things, but you won't really retain it. One of the reasons we give you outlines. Because I want you going away with something you can see. And then meditate on it. And then God will show you more. And he'll apply it to your life. Amen. See, if you're passive about the things of God, you don't know you're in a war. And I guarantee you, that war... Listen to me. In this world's a land of landmines. There's all kinds of stuff. Amen? Amen. How many of you like fear? Well, that's the currency of this world. Amen? What's our part? Just keep our focus on Him. Just keep looking at Him. Just keep driving. And get a revelation that He's good. I'd say, I'll say it again. God's good whether I'm receiving it or not. God's a healer whether I'm... <coughs> God's still a healer. Amen. You understand that? Amen. Amen. So it's not based on whether I receive or don't receive. It's based on what His Word says. See, it's through faith we understand Hebrews 11.3. Most people want to understand and then they'll have faith. That's not how it works. It's through faith. You choose faith, you will understand. And but I can attest to that. I'm understanding more and more and more and more. I think, my word, I found what I'm looking for. And I now have found what I'm looking for. <laughs> Jesus. You didn't know I was that good a singer. All right. <laughs> no comment. Unless a message creates a picture, it will not be retained. Mark chapter 4 verse 33 says, With many such parables spake Jesus the word unto them as they were able to hear it. He used illustrations so they could see it. Like we did earlier. When we say, if you don't tend your garden, what comes up? Corn? Beets? Carrots? Weeds. 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 Same way in our, in our heart. If you don't tend your heart and guard... This is what the Bible says, guard your heart, it says in Proverbs 4.23. Guard, keep or guard your heart with all diligence. Why? For out of it, watch this, flow the issues or the boundaries or the borders of your life. Did you catch that? Amen. Out of your heart, thank you, flow the borders of your life. What scripture is that? Proverbs 4.23. Keep, guard your heart, for out of it flow the issues of life. Let me show you one more. Your heart, so it's not up to God. 1 John 3 says we need to assure our hearts. 
Now, look at, look at uh, Proverbs 17, 20. You'll like this one. I've talked about it before. Proverbs, uh, I think it's 14, 30, says a sound or healed heart is the life of the body. Whew. But envy is the rottenness of the souls. That's Proverbs 14, 30. Look at this one in Proverbs 17, 20. He that hath a, a froward or a twisted heart, he doesn't find any good. Look at it, and then it ties your tongue with that. And he that has a perverse tongue, he falls into mischief or evil. Ramin was telling me about uh, people that cuss all the time and what that does to them, those vile words coming out of their mouth all the time and how that's sowing seeds. You know, everything, our words, our thoughts, there's all seeds, you know that. That's why the Bible says pride goes before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction, Proverbs 16, 18. I mean, most people don't connect the dots. But see, the good news is we can go into Him. He that has a forward heart, he doesn't find any good. That's why he says, guard your heart. For out of it flow the issues, the boundaries, or the borders of your life. Guard it. Guard it from what? Things like offense. Do you know the Bible says, great peace have they who love God's law or word, and nothing shall offend them? Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace. Oh, I love that. Have those who love the word of God, and nothing shall offend them. You can come up to me and say, man, I know you're juicing. There ain't nobody that muscular on their natural. And it won't hurt me. <laughs> Seriously, you can come up and say, man, you really stink as a Bible teacher. It won't bless me. It won't bless me. I can assure you of that. But I'm going on because I don't care. Jimmy crack corn, and I don't care. I'm moving along. Amen? Because I don't answer to you. I answer to him. And so do you. But see, so many people... <laughs> I got offended. He told me, she told me, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that or you need to redo that way. I got offended. Pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up. Fall more in love with the Word of God than you are with your ministry. Come on. Come on. You do that, nothing will offend you. Oh, well, I, I don't quite see it that way, but, you know, then pray about it. All I want is God's will. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. When you hear God, when, when you hear God, you'll see something. When you hear God, you will see something. When you hear God, you'll see something. That's why Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word proceeding out of the mouth of God, the Greek says. Now watch this. The word there for word is revealed word, a word that you see. That's what rhema is. It's a word you see. Not just a word you hear. It's a word you see. Amen. You know why people murmur and complain all the time? Because that's what they see. That's where they're focused. You know why people worry all the time? Because that's what they see. You change your focus, you'll change your feelings. You change your feelings, you'll change your words. Amen. You got to change what you're focused on. That's why the Bible says, look unto Him. There's plenty of things to worry about. You know what worry means? It means to divide into parts. It means to be divided from the whole. Amen. When it comes, you've got to cast it on Him. That's right. So do I. Thank you. I'm not proclaiming anything to you that I don't have to fight. I have the same fight you have. Yes. Yes. Amen. Praise God. When you hear, when, watch this. When you hear circumstances, you'll see something. When you hear circumstances, you'll see something. When Peter was walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14, as long as he kept his eyes upon Jesus, guess what? He was walking. And he was walking above what was threatening to kill the others, right? But as soon as he looked at the circumstance, the Bible says he began to sink. And I studied that word. Because I thought, how do you begin to sink? I've never began to sink. I just sink. <laughs> but that's what it means. It really, literally means he began to sink. Look at Luke chapter 6. It keeps coming to me, so I'm going there. Verse 46. Watch this. Luke 6, 46 through 49. It's not in your outline. Hallelujah. I'm a... No, six. There we go. But he that heareth and doeth, he that heareth and doeth, or acts upon what he hears. Okay? When I did a message a while back called, Are You Obeying What You're Praying? God gives you a directive and, the, and, and faith will have a response. It may just be what you say. 
It may turn into praise. It may be, I mean, I don't know. Every situation is different. It's called relationship. But, but he that heareth and does, uh, but he that heareth and does not, now go back to verse 46. Thank you. I want you to see this whole thing. Jesus said, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, I just did a post this morning. If the Lord is truly your shepherd, he'll make you lie down in green pastures, not lie out of church. Some people don't know the difference. Listen, why are you doing this? Because you need it. I'm done being politically correct. You know what Emerson tells people? Sorry, Emerson. He won't care. He says, you need to come to church. My church. Not that there's not other churches. There is. But there's a lot of squirrely stuff in the name of church too. That's the truth. Do you love people? Yes. But what, what, what if they think this of you? What if they think that? Do I truly love people? Or am I more concerned about what they think about me? Amen. When I spank my kids, I hate it. Hardly ever do it anymore. I let them do it themselves. You know? <laughs> but I hate it. But I love them more than what they think of me. It's called love. Now, I know there's other good churches. I'm not saying that. Thank God for them. But there's a lot of other churches that are mixing the covenants. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. How do you know? Been there, done that. Amen. Threw all my shirts away. Right. Whosoever cometh to me, Jesus said, and he hears my sayings, and he does them, I will show you to whom he is like. Next verse. Thank you. He is like a man which built a house. In other words, he came, he heard, and then he did. A wise man will hear and increase learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Proverbs 1 says, This man who hears and does, he's like a man which built a house. He dig deep. What does digging deep do? It requires work. Work. And it requires time. You're not earning. You're laboring to enter that rest. There's a difference. And he dig deep, he laid the foundation upon a rock. What's the rock? Some people will say Jesus. Well, he is the rock, but the rock here is doing what he said, hearing and doing what he says. Amen. Whew. It's getting tough to get amens. <laughs> and, and when the flood arose, not if it arose. And when situations in life go south, not if they go south. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently or violently and upon that house, it could not shake it for it was founded upon a rock. You. you know why people get offended at this and that in, in, in life and they're your friends and they're not your friends and all that stuff? Because they're shallow people. That's right. They're shallow people. They're, they're, they get offended over everything. Man, get over it. Life will offend you. You know what makes a good family a good family? They get over offense. Yes. Yeah. I see families where when people are mad at people for years. You know, I commend my brothers. Growing up and seeing all the athletic talent in one child. <laughs> and they've gotten over it. You've got to tip your hat to them. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> so this man, he, he, he was like a man. He built a house. He dig deep. He laid the foundation on the rock. When the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently. And that house, upon that house, they could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Next verse. He, but he that hears, notice they both hear. And he doesn't do it. He's like unto a man. He doesn't have a foundation. The foundation he's talking of here, watch this, I believe it correlates to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. The six foundational doctrines of Christ. Now, Jesus is my rock that doesn't roll. Do you ever talk to him? Do you ever have fellowship with him? Do you ever have a relationship with him? He's not your rock if you're not hearing his words. You can't live by physical food alone. You must live by the revealed, seen, or shown word to you of God. Amen. Amen. You can exist for a while. You can exist for 50, 60, 70, 90 years. I don't know. But eventually... Yeah. Boy, there's so many great things to say. You know what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 11, that childhood and youth are vanity? You know why it says that? Because when you're young, you think you're invincible. How many know as you go through life a little bit, you find out you're not quite so invincible? You realize, whoa, I heard about that when I was younger, and I thought, pff, pff, whatever. Not me. It becomes more of a fight. You don't want to... Uh, so many good things to say. We're all fighting that because we're in a corrupt world. 
You know, people that don't believe the Bible's true, they need to study science, real science. The second law of thermodynamics says order goes to disorder. In other words, things wear out. That's what aging is, you know that. It's decay. I don't like to say it either. But that's what it is. And we're fighting it, right? As best we can. And eventually these bodies, we're going to exit these bodies. You think, oh, I'm going to live for... Listen, this year just started. We're almost halfway through June. Time is screaming. I'm excited. I'm just passing through. I'm going to make every moment count. And I don't want to lay on a beach sipping a drink with an umbrella in it. I want to touch lives. That's my desire because I'm a new creation. And I'm on fire with the Holy Ghost. And you can be too. And hopefully you are. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste time. There's a time to lay in a hammock, but it's not all the time. And when you're there, you can be meditating on the Word of God. I like Andrew was talking about his vacation. He said, on my vacation, I probably spent 15 hours a day in the Word. Just love. He's in love. He's in love. And when you get a couple that's yoked, evenly yoked like that, I'm telling you what, we're yoking better and better all the time. That's too deep. Okay, moving right along. All right. When, you're circum when, when you hear circumstances, you'll see something. Now, let me, let me do number... I'm going to quickly do these last ones and, and we'll uh, get ready for it. If you see Jesus in the Word, you'll see God as your Father in your life. Because Jesus revealed the Father, John 14, 9. But if you see Him in the Word, but if you don't see Jesus in the Word, thank you. If you don't see Jesus in the Word, then all you'll see is what you have to do to be right with God. Can you hear that? If you see Jesus in the Word, you'll see that what Jesus did made you right with God and you put your faith in Him. But if you don't see Jesus in the Word, you'll see what you have to do to measure up and be right with God in your own strength. Hello, man-made religion. That's why they, and people think religion is about, well, he's a good man. She's a good woman. Listen, we're all a mess. We're all a mess, every one of us. You may be a more sophisticated mess than somebody else, but you're still a mess. See that? That's what, that's what Jesus said in John 6, or excuse me, Luke 16, 15, where he says, You are they which uh, justify yourselves among men, but God knows your heart, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What's highly esteemed among men? Self justification. That's why politicians are always holding babies. He or she's such a good man or such a good woman. Moving right along. All right. Human religion teaches people to attempt to believe God without seeing Jesus. Very, it's often very subtle. You attempt to see God without seeing Jesus. One of my favorites, it's not in your outline, but let's go there. Oh, my word. Oh, praise God. We're going to have to finish. Uh, 1 Peter 1.21. We're wrapping up. We'll roll some of this. I, um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Watch this. You know, you know this verse I'm madly in love with. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. I love this verse. Who by Him, Jesus, through Him, dia, through the, through the agency of, through Him do believe in God. Stop right there. How are you believing in God? Is it through Him or is it through you? Who by Him do believe in God that raised Him up from the dead, watch it, this, and gave Him glory and that gave Him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. If you're not believing in God through Jesus, your faith and hope will not be anchored in God. It'll be anchored in you. And you'll go like this your whole life. You'll go just like that. Like so many people do. Yes, yes. You know, and I say these things, God is good even when you're not. That makes some people go, oh my word. How can he say that? Now people are going to go nuts. They're already going nuts. I'm trying to show them the answer. But you got to believe in God through him. And that takes, watch this, that takes effort. That takes time. That takes digging deep. Laying it on the foundation, getting to know Him. Yes. How many know any good relationship takes time? Yes. I said that our minister's thing this week. I said, listen, if you're going to be in a relationship, you, you, it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. Yes. He that has friends must show himself friendly, it's what Proverbs 18 says. It's going to take some work, but it's worth it. Amen? Right. I see a society a lot of times where we live in what I call entitlement friendship. That means you owe me, you need to be my friend whether I do exert any effort or not. Doesn't work that way. Doesn't work that way. If I want a good relationship with my wife, I'm going to have to invest in our relationship. All right, moving right along. Okay, we're, I'm just going to hit a couple of these. I love what Barry Bennett says, words without pictures are stillborn. 
If you're just speaking something and you're not, you don't have a picture of it, you need to stay in the Word until you see it on the inside. If you're, if, when God shows you something, like the Lord's had me in Psalm chapter 5, and the Lord's just shown me stuff. And I'm going to tell you what, some, it makes me cry when I see, when, I, when He's speaking to me directly from the Word. I can tell. It's different than it used to be. This is not just getting a bunch of information so I can spout off verses. This is getting a revelation on the inside. And when I see it, and when God shows it to me, I think, my word, He's talking to me. He's talking to you. This isn't a relationship with a book. <laughs> this is a relationship with God through the road map. And the Holy Spirit guides you into it. You can't even understand the Bible without the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. Say that. You can't. I can. No, you can't. If any man am, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may be wise. First Corinthians 3.18. What does that mean? Lay aside his wisdom for God's wisdom. You've got to humble yourself to do that. Amen. Praise God. We're going to wrap it up here. Uh, the minister's job is to paint pictures which gives birth to vision or sight. Uh, number five was we must spend enough time in the word to allow it to paint a picture of the promise over the problem. One more verse, Hebrews eleven twenty seven. You must spend enough time in the word to allow it to paint a picture of the promise over the problem. The problem's already got a picture, but look at Hebrews, can I have Hebrews eleven twenty seven? This is talking about Moses. Watch this. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, put yourself in this situation. Imagine the leader of the nation is after you because you've done something. And not, not just to put you in jail. They want to kill you. This is by faith. He forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king of Pharaoh. Watch this. For he endured. How did he endure? As seeing him who is invisible. How do we endure? By seeing him who is invisible. How do you see something that's invisible? You see it in your heart. That's how we endure. But if you're not seeing who, him who is invisible, hope will go right down the tubes. And see, without hope, faith has nothing to give substance to. Praise God. There's a lot more in this outline, and it's awesome. And I'll try to see about rolling some of it in next week. We'll see how that goes. Next week is Father's Day, amen? amen. Have the prayer team come up. We got a wonderful.